first thing that I want to talk about today is you've just downloaded Rhino and you're staring at the screen and you're trying to figure out what in the world you want to do. Anytime I try a new piece of software, the very first thing I want to do is figure out, A, how do I rotate the model? Well, in Rhino, you're going to right click and just rotate. If you want to zoom, if you have a three button mouse with a scroll wheel, you can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Or you can right click and hold down the control key and drag up or down to scroll in or out. So a lot of this is happening on the right mouse button. Right mouse button by itself rotates. Scroll wheel is going to zoom in and out. Or the control right mouse button is going to zoom in and out. Right mouse button plus shift is going to allow you to pan around the screen. So all of the action that's happening as far as navigation is focused on the right mouse button if you have a three button mouse. The only addition would be if you have a scroll wheel, you can use the scroll wheel to zoom. So that's kind of 101. How do you get around this thing? Okay. Now the other thing that you'll notice down here is these tabs. And this is a really fast way of navigating between your four different windows. Well, what if I want to see all four windows at the same time? Well, if you notice up in the corner, there's a label that is telling you which view you're in. If you double click that, you'll jump back to a, a, four, a four window setup and you can work in each mode. And obviously anything that you draw is going to show up in all four views at the same time. Now the cool thing about Rhino is you can have a couple of different display modes going on at each time. So you'll notice in this window I have this shaded and I can pick which display mode I want. I can do shaded, I can do wireframe, I can do technical, I can do you know all this kind of stuff here. And in these views you'll notice that these are set to wireframe. So sometimes it's very helpful if you have one view, say your perspective view set to shaded, and your other view set to wireframe, it's an easy way to to navigate through there. So let's let's focus on one view at this at the at this particular time and we'll just double click on the perspective window and jump back up into there. Okay? So other basic navigation things you'll notice at the top the tools are arranged in tabs and the standard tab is basically, you know, what you're going to be working with most of the time when you run Rhino. This is basically the tab that I have open most of the time, but there's also a tab for each individual little segment like construction planes, uh, different display modes, different ways just to select, deformation tools, viewport layouts, on and on and on. So go ahead and play with those. The other thing is if you grab the tab and move it, you can arrange these how you like it. So if you don't ever use viewport layouts, maybe you'll drag this all the way down here. So then it's laid out down here. Or if you don't use it at all, you can just tear it off and shut it off and then it'll no longer be up in your tab view up here. Okay? So we know how to turn around, we know how to zoom in and out, we know how to pan, we know how to go through our tabs and all this kind of stuff. So what's the very first thing that we're going to do? Well, we've got a clean sheet sitting in front of us, right? So if you're anything like me, the very th first thing that you're going to want to do is load some sort of reference. Um, I always, always, always start models this way, um, even if it's just a quick sketch. And to do that, we're going to do, I'm going to switch to the front view because I, this is how I prefer to set stuff up. And I'm going to use the picture frame command. And what picture frame does is it allows you to bring in, and in this case we're going to build a water bottle, a reference image. All right. Now the cool thing about this reference image is this is a piece of geometry, if I go to the perspective view. This is a plane that you can move. I can scale it. I can rotate it. I can scale it in one direction. I can do anything like that based off of any of the movements with the gumball. And we'll talk about gumball in just a second. But the cool thing about it, since this is just a piece of geometry, if I go to my layers tab, I can make a new layer or I can rename one of the layers, image, right click on this, change object layer, and now my image, move the go to the new panel down here, now my image is on a layer by itself and I can turn it on and off and I can lock it. 
so that I can model without selecting this and I can truly use this as an image plane. So let's go back to our front view and take a look at this. Now, I'll notice on here there's some comments, some crystal clear client direction. And um, what the main thing that I'm noticing here is they've given me a very nebulous direction of this is about 12 inches-ish. So I want to try and figure out how to make that 12 inches. Well, I locked this so I can't modify it. So I'm going to unlock it here in Layers Palette. And I'm going to move this to about zero. But one of the problems that I'm having is the image is obscuring my grid. I can't really see where I want to put this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this plane and I'm going to hit the F3 key, which is going to light up the Properties palette. And you'll notice in this tab, Properties tab, I guess, is actually the correct terminology. You'll notice that there's object properties, there's material properties, there's texture mapping, and there's decals. Well, the thing that I want to focus on right now is I can't see through this, so this is a materials issue. So I'm going to click on the materials button, and you'll notice that what Rhino's done uh, when I imported this picture frame is it took a plane and automatically applied, a, in this case it was a JPEG image, to that plane, scaled it, and allowed me to drop it into the into Rhino's window. Well, if you notice down here, let me expand this a little bit so you can read them. There's all sorts of different finishes in here, and the one that I'm going to focus on is transparency. So I'm just going to drag this to make this more transparent. And once I get it to about where I want, I'm going to go back to my Layers tab, and I'm going to lock this. So now it's in my window. And I don't really like where the position of that is, so I'm going to unlock it. And I'm going to just use Gumball. I'm going to slide it kind of back in my modeling window and lock it. So let's go look at the front view and see what we've got. All right. So and maybe I'll move it over just a little bit so that it's kind of centered. So I'm going to lay this out kind of right about in there. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to figure out where 12 inches is. And the easiest way that I do that is I'll pick a, a regular polyline. I'm going to the start of my polyline. This is one thing that I want you to get used to doing, Rhino, is actually looking at the command line because the command line is going to offer you all sorts of things that are going to give you clues as to what you should do next. And in this case, the start of the polyline. Well, I want to start the polyline at zero, so I'm going to just type zero and hit enter. And the first part of the polyline is going to be snapped directly to the origin. Now, I know I want to get about 12 inches long, so I'm going to type 12 and hit enter again. And now you'll notice that what Rhino's done is it's at a 12 unit long line. In this case, I'm working in inches, so I know I'm in inches. And I'm going to hold the shift key to snap this straight, and then I'm going to just drag one more line over. So basically what I've done is I notice, okay, here's my origin. This is where I'm going to start, and this is where I'm going to end. So I'm going to pick this plane. And I'm going to run the scale command. And I'm going to start the origin point. I want it to be at 0, so I'm just going to type 0 and hit Enter. And I'm going to start right about here, holding the Shift key. I'm going to click, and then I'm going to just drag until it snaps up to there. Now, the snaps you'll notice, these are called O snaps down here. And what O snaps do is they give you the opportunity to snap to different pieces of geometry. And we'll talk more about this as we go forward. But um, I want to make you aware of what this is. In, in, while I'm modeling, I use the Disable key. And basically what that does is that allows me to model without O-snaps until I need them. And the, the hot key for the Disable and Enable is to hold down the Alt key when you're trying to snap to something. And I'll, I'll point that out as we go forward. But you can see now that we've basically moved this this picture frame, we've scaled it, we've moved it to the origin so it's about where we want it to be, and we've made a 12 inch long line, and we've eyeballed this to line it up. So let's take a, little, a look at, at what this mythical client of ours is asking for. So our crystal clear client direction is to make a bottle just like this one, but not too much like this one. Uh, we want to do the details just like they have here, but different in a way that makes you feel, feel fulfilled as an individual. The shape should indicate a higher state of being, but not in a pretentious way. You know, elegant, but not snobby. And they want it delivered yesterday, cost reduced $11 of manufacturing expense out of it, and they want us to have fun and put our special magic in it. Okay, um, 
they spent all their money on gas for the private jet, so they're going to pay us in March of next year. Uh, also, we notice that there's a comment here that the magic goes here. So whatever that means, this is this is what we're starting to deal with. All right. So let's uh, with that client direction in mind, let's let's take a look at how we're going to go ahead and start to build this. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to start by drawing a curve. And you'll notice in the standard toolbar, in the default toolbar layout, that we have a bunch of different curve tools here. Now, if you fly these out, you'll notice in this little corner, you'll see a little triangle. And if you fly that out, there'll be a palette of different curves. And if you grab this by the title bar, you can actually drag it out and dock it. In this case, we're not going to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and pick the first one, which is a polyline. And I'm going to start at zero. We know that we're going to probably end up doing a revolved surface. So I'm going to start at zero. I'm just going to type zero and hit enter. I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to drag over. Now there's some, there's some distortion in this photograph. So obviously we're not going to build a roundy bottom because this thing won't stand up. So we're going to go ahead and just use the shift key and then let the shift key go. And then I'm going to hold down the shift key again because that constrains to vertical. And then I'm going to let shift key go. And I'm going to hold down shift key again. And then I'm going to let it go. And then I'm going to take a look at the cap. And I'm going to need a little offset in here. So I'm going to shift key there. I'm going to keep the shift key down. And I'm going to go about there. Okay. So that's our curve. So let's take a look at that in perspective and see what we've got. All right. I don't need this 12-inch line anymore, so I'm going to just get rid of it. That was just to scale the drawing. So this is our curve. So let's take a look at what we've got here. All right. So we drew a curve, and now I need to do something with it. Well, if we go back to front view, maybe we've decided that we want to, as our, as our direction says, we want to want to make a bottle just like this, but not too much like that. So let's go in and make a couple of design decisions. And in order to do that, I'm going to modify the curve a little bit. So I'm going to turn points on, and I'm going to do that by left clicking on this button down here. And if you hover, you'll notice in Rhino there's a little tool tip that'll pop up, and it says left mouse button is points on, right mouse button is points off. So let's turn points on. And the way that you do that is to pick the curve, left click on the button, and you'll get points on. Now I can go ahead and modify this. And in this case, I'm using Gumball, which is allowing me to move kind of predictably. And we'll talk more about Gumball as we go forward. But Gumball basically is, being, is able to be turned on here. You can turn it on or off. And what it allows you to do is the manipulator to allow you to navigate in 3D space. So let's play with this a little bit. Maybe I want to, don't want that to be dead flat. Maybe I want it to have a little bit of an angle. And maybe this is supposed to be a little deeper. Maybe we'll pull that in just a hair. All right. So if we're happy with that, I can either right click on points off or I can just hit the escape key. And that will turn points off. So let's go ahead and build a surface. I'm going to go back to perspective view. And actually, now I'm going to do this in front of you. So let's pick our curve and let's revolve it. Very simple operation. So I'm going to revolve by left clicking on here. And again, notice the tool tips popping up. And start of the revolve axis. Well, I know it's at zero, so I can either type zero or I can use my O snap <clears throat> by hitting the Alt key, which shuts, enables my O snaps. Click there, hold the Shift key to determine my axis. <clears throat> and you'll notice that there's some options up here. In this case, I'm going to just use the defaults, and I'm going to just right-click, and then right-click again. And what that's going to do is then spin us a surface. Now, here's where the fun starts. Now, if you notice down here, when I built this, the Record History button was turned on. And the Record History is really cool, because what it does is it creates a connection between the original curve and the resulting object. And in this case, the curve looked OK when I drew it, but this thing is looking really spindly and kind of weak in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick my original curve. I'm going to turn the points back on. Let's go back to front view. And 
I'm going to grab these two points and I'm going to drag them out a little bit. Let's go back to perspective and see what we've got. So that looks a little better down there. Maybe that's too much. And this looks really spindly in here, so let's fix that. And you'll notice that by manipulating the curve, the surface is updating. And this is one of the things that I love as a designer because it allows you to make decisions in 3D and have immediate feedback as to what the styling choices that you're making here. And the cool thing about that is you're designing in 3D, not just modeling in 3D. We don't want to make model monkeys. We don't want CAD monkeys just punching you know, numbers into uh, a CAD terminal. We want you to be a designer. We want you to be able to create art with this. So having history turned on allows you to make some decisions and ultimately evaluate your model in 3D uh, to get the best result. So let's say that we're happy with that. We need it to fit in a you know, bicycle water bottle cage, so it's got to have a little step in here. And let's go back to front view and just take a look at this. And I'm kind of happy with how this is, has just a little bit of taper to it. And we've got our space for our cap. Maybe I'm going to make just a tinier, a little bit tinier cap and say OK. All right. <clears throat> now, that's all well and good. What happens if I were to be modeling along and I happen to bump this curve? Whoa! What happens? I don't want that. Okay, I just made a, a protein powder bottle. I don't want that. So at this point, history is kind of getting in my way. Well, let's get rid of history. So I'm going to click on this. Well, there's nothing to shut history off in here. So what I need to do is I actually need to pick, I need to type, start typing history in the command line. And you'll see that all of the things that are related to history come out in a drop down. And this is, this is common behavior in all of Rhino. If you start typing a command and don't just immediately hit enter, it'll do a drop down for everything that has anything to do with history. And in this case, I want to purge the history because I want to get rid of it because it's now in the way. So I'm going to say history purge and I'm going to say all and it's going to say purge history from 11 objects. So now when I move this, you'll notice that the curve no longer has that historical connection with the underlying object. Okay, so in that case, I could delete the curve, I could throw it on a layer. Uh, let's throw it on a layer because I like to keep those. So I'm going to change the layer to curve and I did that just by double clicking. This is highlighted, so I'm going to just right click here and say change object to layer. So now I can just shut that layer off. All right. Well, we talked about Gumball a little bit, but let's talk about one part of Gumball that not a lot of people know. Uh, Gumball has the, uh, has the ability to be able to modify a polysurface. And this is called a polysurface in Rhino because it's a, essentially an object made up of a bunch of different surfaces connected together. Well, I love the historical connection because I was able to make modifications to this bottle. And I just deleted my history. And obviously, I could undo and get that back. But let's say, for whatever reason, I couldn't do that. And I wanted to make some changes. Well, if I hold down Control and Shift, and let's say click on an edge, you'll notice that that edge lights up. Well, Gumball gives you the ability to be able to do what's called a sub-object selection, which allows you to go in and actually modify parts of the model, and the rest of the model will update. This is something that after I started using it, I will nerd fight anyone who tries to take it away from me because I use this all the time. So you can, you can control shift on an edge, you can control shift on a surface, you can control shift on an object within this, and as you move it, you'll notice the rest of the model will update. So let's just make a little adjustment here like that. Okay. So we're pretty happy with this, so let's start refining it. And the first thing that we want to do is start adding some fillets here. So I'm going to go under the Solid Tools menu, and I'm going to use the Fillet tool. And let's just start putting some fillets on the bottom of this. And you'll notice that 
I was messing around with this before, so I changed what the default setting is. The default setting is typically one, but you'll notice that though there will be a preview of what your fillet is going to look like. So you can kind of visualize what your fillet's going to do. And in this case, this is really big. So I'm going to just click and drag to make it a little bit smaller. And you'll notice that I've got a value here. Now, 0.497 is kind of an awkward value to throw in a model. Um, it would be a weird dimension to throw on a drawing. So I'm going to double click. I'm just going to click this. And I'm going to type in 0.5. And that's going to actually give me an exact value for that fillet. I'm going to right click to accept. And the fillet goes on. So let's do that a few more times. Let's throw a few more of these. And I'm going to pick a few edges this time. And let's go and adjust them all independently. So I'm going to adjust this one to, eh, let's say, 0.45. I'm going to adjust this one to, well, let's say, 0.35. And notice what I'm doing. I'm kind of dragging this until I get it to about what my designer's eye says is right. And then I'm typing in a value that makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to drag here. And somewhere in this neighborhood feels good. So 0.6 seems to be a, a logical value for that. So let's run those. Pretty happy with that. All right, so let's go ahead and finish these up. And obviously, you could do these all at the same time if you wanted. We're just choosing to break it up a little bit for repetitive learning's sake. I'm going to make this a tiny one. And I'm going to make this 0.2. Oops, 0.2. And that one's 1 1.048. I'm going to fix that one just to be straight up one. Run those. And let's put a little teeny one right here. Now. One thing you'll notice about the preview, check this out. All right, so you'll see this big curve in here, right? And you'll notice that this way out here, so this is where this fillet's going to go. Obviously, this fillet is going to fail. And the reason it's going to fail is because it's going to go from here to here. So look at your geometry and look at the room that you have to put this fillet in, all right? This fillet started here and ended here. So this surface really only has this much space to work with. So if I drag this in till my preview is inside that surface, and it looks like, eh, let's do 0.12. You'll notice now that this, this preview is now well within the confines of this particular surface. So that fillet's going to work. All right? If you're doing crazy large fillets and they're crossing and doing all sorts of stuff like that, you're obviously going to have a problem. So We've defined our volume, and let's use one of my favorite commands, which is cap. And cap, what it does, will evaluate your model and look for any planar surfaces and cap them. So now this is a solid volume. How do we know it's a solid volume? Because we're going to pick it. We're going to go here under the, what's this menu called? The Analyze Direction tool, and we're going to go down to Show Edges. Now, show edges brings up this little edge analysis toolbar. And I use this all the time. If this was a real tool, the paint would be worn off of it because I use it so much. Now, what it does is it evaluates your model. And it'll say, hey, there's 34 edges in this model. There's no naked edges. There's no manifold edges. That means this is watertight. This is watertight. There's no holes in it. There's no problems with it. This could go to CNC, this could go to rapid prototyping, you could send this to Pro Engineer, you could send this to SolidWorks, and it would come in as a solid volume. Okay. So we're going to refer to this a bunch of times. We're going to go through edge analysis several times to make sure that, that we do this. And when I'm doing complicated models, I actually will leave this open all the time so that I can continually evaluate my model and have immediate feedback as to whether or not there's any issue. All right. So. <clears throat> Our client has given us the direction of this is where the magic goes. So I'm assuming that that uh, piece of direction means that there should be some sort of detailing in here. So let's look at adding some detail to this. And this is a trick that I use all the time. It's super simple. It allows you to get really great results. And, and it's really easy to do, which is one of my favorite things because I'm lazy. I'm going to take this, and then let's say I wanted to add a little scoop in here, and I want to mirror this. So I'm going to pick this curve, 
I'm going to go into the transformation palette and I'm going to just mirror this. Now the start of the mirror plane obviously is at zero. I have copy set to yes. If you click this it changes from yes to no. And I'm going to just move that up like that. So I've got a copy of the curve. These are both identical. And I'm going to use wire cut. And wire cut is really cool because what it allows you to do is to cut solid chunks out of a solid piece and not have to build all of the connecting surfaces that you would if you were typically doing a NURBS model. So let's run wire cut. I'm going to pick this. This is the cutting line. This is the object cut. And I'm going to just run that through there. I'm going to do the same thing over here. And you'll see that what's happened is it's created two solid bits, right? If I pull these out of here. Not only has it cut the solid bit out, but it's also made the connecting surfaces on both sides. So this is still, if we look at all three of these, when we check for naked edges, there's no naked edges. So these are all watertight parts. Well, that's all well and good, but the trick part of this comes from, if I go to the front, and I use Gumball while holding Shift, I can pick any of the scale manipulators, and I can scale these guys down a little bit. Now what I'm doing is I'm getting my offset. See that? So I've sunk these in to the surface a little bit, but if you'll notice, they're not overlapping. That's not cool. That's not going to make, that's not going to do what I want it to do. So I'm going to go back to here. Now without using shift, I'm going to just stretch these up a little bit. So now they're completely intersecting. Let me hide these, get rid of these curves. So these are completely intersecting. So if I shade this, you'll see that they're intersecting. The reason that I'm doing that is because now I can use a Boolean union by picking all of these parts and Booleaning, Booleaning them together. All right. So when I run this, you'll notice that if I wireframe this, that it's assembled all these pieces, gotten rid of all the unnecessary stuff, and given us a little magic as the client has requested. All right. Well. That's great, but it's a, it's a solid chunk now. And this is where you need to make a decision, understanding where your model is going to go. Are you the last set of hands that's going to touch this model? Are you the guy that's sending it to the CNC? Uh, are you the person who is sending it to tooling? Are you the person that's sending it to rapid prototyping? If so, then you get to make different decisions. Are you sending this to an engineer? Well, if you're sending this to an engineer, chances are this is as far as you need to go. Because if you're sending this to an engineer, they will most likely want to do their own shelling. All right. If you're sending it to SolidWorks, if you're sending it to ProE, they will most likely want to do their own shelling. So you're done. This is where you would go. But let's say you're not. Let's say um, if you're like me, you're running a consultancy and you're the one that's responsible for getting this where it needs to go. So I need to create some wall thickness here. So I'm going to run the shell command. <clears throat> And a little, a little chat about Shell. Uh, Shell has come a long way. Uh, it was, it was um, I don't want to say experimental, but it was, um, what's the polite way to say it? Not good for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think not good is probably the, the nicest way to say it. But it's come a very long way, and it actually works quite well now. So there's a few caveats that I want to I talk about. The way that this model is set up right now, all of the fillets will most likely shell just fine. This detail right here, you'll notice that I have not put fillets on. All right? And there's a reason for that, because these fillets are very small. And if I put a very small fillet on here and shell this, it's going to create an offset, which will most likely cause a bow tie situation. So let me offset this. Let me shell this. And I'm going to change the thickness to 0.08. In this case, it would be 80 thousandths. I'm going to pick this space right here. And shell should calculate for a little bit. And let's check it. So we have no naked edges, no non-manifold edges. So it's created the wall thickness in here. If we go into wireframe, you'll notice that it's created the wall thickness in here. Now, let's talk about about these edges again. So the reason that I didn't fill it those edges is because 
since this was small, I would have had a very small fillet on here. When this offset this way and this offsets this way, it would have turned that fillet inside out, possibly causing shell to fail. That's a very common scenario for why shell would fail. So I left that unfilleted because that it's much easier for shell to do a straight offset without fillets than it is for it to do an offset with fillets. So now, since the shell has, has finished successfully, let's go ahead and put our fillets back. So I'm going to just pick both of these. And in this case, they're set to 0.89, and you'll notice right off the bat, this is going to fail because they're overlapping. So I'm going to bring this down to about there, and I'm going to bring this one down to about here. So now I'm not overlapping anymore, and let's put some you know, reasonable values in here, 0.15, and uh, we'll just make them both 0.15. That seems to make sense. Let's run it, and let's run on the inside as well. Let me just do, I'll do 0.1 on the inside. And point one on the outside. We'll close. And it looks like we have a little naked edge down here. So we'll we'll take a look at that. Let's see what's going on. Let's analyze this. All right. So it says there's 148 edges total, but there's four naked edges, which means that this is no longer watertight. So I need to back out of this. And let's take a look at this and make sure that that all worked, and it did. So let's run fill it again and just make sure. Let's try one at a time. Use a little uh, smaller version. And for some reason, that's creating a little problem right there. So let's just go forward and we'll address that once we get the other stuff in. So that one worked, that one didn't. And do point one there. That one had a problem. This one didn't, I'm assuming. So that one worked. All right, so we've got a little issue there and we'll deal with that in, in, in just a second. But let's take a look at the other side. Let's run these. So we're going to run all of this. And, and I'm going to pick all of these at this time and show you a cool trick. Notice that once I've picked all my edges and right click to accept, there's a set all button in here. I'm going to click set all. And I'm going to set them all at the same time to point one and let them run. So let's check our, let's check our naked edges. So this worked and this didn't. We could spend all of our time scratching our heads trying to figure out why that is, or we could use the trick that I always use, which is to draw a line through the model, pick it, run the trim tool, trim that side off, mirror it like we did before, pick the entire thing, and join. Two surfaces are poly surface joined into one closed pos one closed surface. I like that better than I like trying to figure out what happened to those fillets before. All right, so now we're back to having a closed. Let's take a look at that. No naked edges, no manifolds. We're good to go. We've got our water bottle. So let's shade that and take a look at what we've got. So we're pretty good to go. The only thing that we need to do still is we need to build a cap. And there's a couple of cool tricks that we can do with this. One of them is getting a surface off of an existing surface. So watch this. If we control shift click this edge, okay, and I'm just going to control shift click all of these edges. If I click and hold and then click and hold control, I can drag a new surface right off of the existing one. See that? Not only do I know that that surface is correct because it came right off of this, 
but it's also placed correctly. And I dragged it up just a little higher than I needed it to be. So I'm going to hit join. And cap. Now, I'm going to scale this up just a hair because I need a little bit of clearance. And let's take a look at our reference image. All right, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. Maybe I'm going to make it just a little bigger. And I'm going to shift drag on the gumball scaler to get something like that. Now, there's a little tab here, and there's a little detail and a few other things. So let's look at how to do that. So in this case, I'm going to hide the bottle because I just want to work on the cap. And let's look at another tool called Extract Surface. This is a poly surface right now, so I can't really do much with it. So I'm going to right click on the explode icon and I'm going to extract a surface. And in this case, I want it to copy. So I'm going to pick this one and then I'm going to scale it up just a hair. See this? See what I'm doing? I'm, I'm making stuff off of other stuff so that I don't have to draw stuff from scratch because I'm really lazy. Okay, not only is it positioned in space, but I don't have to draw a curve and then make a plane and then extrude stuff. I can just extract, click control, drag, and I get a little detail. Okay, so let's Boolean these two together and take a look at what we've got. Now, one thing that you'll notice that came out of this Boolean is if I do a subobject selection, you notice there's a surface there and there's a surface there. That might necess not necessarily be what I want. So now instead of extracting the surface and copying, I'm going to extract the surface and not copy and then delete it. Run cap again and now I have a clean surface there. Okay. So let's say instead of having in our, in our reference, this looks like it's like a flip top, but I hate these little tabby things. So let's say that this is going to be screw top. All right. So let's make a little neural detail on here and take a look at that. And I'll show you a trick that I like to do with Booleans that, to do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to make a just a cube, and I'm going to use O-snap to land the center of it right about there. I'm going to drag it here, and I'm just going to add an arbitrary value like a quarter of an inch. And then I'm going to move this so that it's not only inset, but scaled so that it fits kind of completely within here. Now, notice I'm avoiding this lip down here, and there's a reason for that. So let me shade this and go to perspective view. So this is what I've got. Now, if I were to make this neural like this, it would have a flat. And I don't really want it to be flat. I want it to be curved. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the Boolean split. And this is the object that I'm going to split. So I'm going to right click to accept that. And this is the object that I'm going to use to split it. Now I'm going to delete this part. And you'll notice that I get a little gnarly with a curve that matches the surface. Now if I wanted to be super technical about this, I should probably scale this so it stays concentric, but this is a small enough object that I'm not really going to get too nutty about that. So now I'm going to just use Gumball to position it in space. And now I'm going to drop it into that lip. Okay, So I, I built it above the lip, and then I dropped it into the lip afterwards because I didn't want to have that Boolean split put the lip in there because that would have caused a problem. So. Um, so let's take a look at this and, and figure out what we're going to do with it. So let's go to top view. And I'm using hotkeys, which is bad for beginner's webinar. But the, if you want to go to your, another way to go to your views is to, is to right click on your window icon. And then you can set the views up here. Okay. So let's array this. Let's make more of these. So we're going to go to transform array polar. The center of the polar array, I'm going to use my O snaps and I'm going to light it up by holding the Alt key and I'm going to find my center. Number of items, uh, let's start with like, I don't know, 15 and run it. Now you'll notice if you look in here, these are overlapping. So 15 is too many. So I'm going to change this to 12 
and now I've got a little bit of space in there. So now I'm going to accept that by right clicking and go back to perspective view and you'll notice that it's arrayed around there. Now, history was on. The cool thing about this is whatever I do to the original gen object is going to translate through the rest of the array. So say for instance this is too big. I can shrink this. All of them are going to shrink. Now I'm going to move it down. All of them are going to move down. Let's say I move it this way. All of them are going to move it that way. All right. So as long as you maintain that historical connection, anything you do here is going to work out with the rest of these. So let's go ahead and Boolean all of this stuff together. Let's just mash it all together. So we're going to pick everything and hit Boolean Union. It's going to go ahead and run that. And let's look and see what else we need to do to this. So let's bring our model back. So I'm going to write show and the command line. And I'm going to go to my print view. And we need to build this little pop up here with the little nubby thing. And for this particular exercise, I'm going to assume that this is a concept model, not necessarily a manufacturing model. So the idea is to get something that I can show the client for them to look at. So let's build a little piece in here. I'm going to use a I'm going to use the cylinder command and I want to light that up right in the center and I'm going to drag it out to about where I think it needs to be and then just pull it up. Okay, let's go in front view and see how we did. Not bad. I'm going to sync this just a hair so when it booleans it can do it. Booleans don't like to be line to line. They like to have just a tiny bit of overlap. And I'm a little high here so I'm going to hold down control and shift and I'm going to drag this edge and I do a sub-object selection to shorten this. See how cool that is? See how cool you can go in and just play with this stuff and get it to be exactly how you want it to be? So let's add the little nubby on the top. And in that case, it's going to be another cylinder. So let's go back to perspective. And let's extract a surface and copy. And I'm going to click Control, drag to extrude that, and now I'm going to shift drag to make it a little bigger. All right, so I feel pretty good about what we've created here, and now we just need to do a little bit of refinement. So I'm going to hide the bottle again, just so that that's all I'm looking at, and start throwing some fillets on this. Okay, same scenario we did before. I'm going to work on the major fillet first, and in this case, Maybe I even want that to be a little bigger. So I'm going to drag this bigger like that. And I'm just going to enter a value that makes sense. 0.197 is an awkward value. So that runs. Let's do this one. Eh, that looks pretty good. Go ahead and run that. And let's put a teeny tiny one here. Now, let's take a look at our preview. All right, that's way too big. See, it's overlapping like that, so we're going to drag it down something like, oh, 0.015. And we'll do the same thing down here. And I'm going to do set all now like that. And I'm going to leave these sharp. You know, ideally, ideally you'd probably fill those off, but I think I'm going to leave those sharp for this particular thing. And let's soften up the top of this. Got to give the client something to hate every so once in a while, right? Otherwise, they'll pick on big stuff. So I'll let them pick on that fillet and make these a little bigger. I'm going to get them close till they feel right. You know, I'm kind of making an artistic decision about how I want those rounded. And you'll notice that the values aren't the same. So I'm, not, I'm going to use set all now. 
so that they're both the same and then accept it and that softens that up. So let's bring our bottle back using the show command and take a look at what we did. What did you do? Actually it looks like we did something cool. Alright, get rid of that. I'm going to hide the image and take a look at the model. Now, the last thing I want to do, I want to make sure I didn't do anything dumb, so I'm going to select the whole thing and say add objects. I'm checking for naked edges. No naked edges, no, man, no non-manifold edges. That means that this entire thing is watertight and will go to a 3D printer. Okay. So let's display this in a, in a little bit better light. So let's go to looking over here. These are kind of the defaults that come up. If you right click on any of these tabs, you'll notice there's all this other stuff you can load. Cool things like, oh, I don't know, ground plane. Let's look at that. Well, that's cool, but what happens if we go to display and turn on shadows? Ooh. Now we're getting a cool, a little bit cooler version of that. Okay. And maybe we even go in here and turn on the sun. And we turn on the manual controls. And we mess with this a little bit. And we brew this up a little bit. And we move this around a little bit. Okay. Let's go to rendered. Oh, now the sun's affecting stuff. So we can actually come through here and put our shadows where we want it and change our orientation. Okay. Well, if we wanted to add some color to this, okay, well, that's fine. Let's go to materials. Let's turn the materials tab on. In the materials, you notice there's nothing loaded in there, so we're going to come in here and let's go with uh, plastic. And we'll go plastic high gloss. And we're going to just drag and drop that on there and change the color. Let's make it red. You'll notice that we're starting to get some shiny going on there. Let's make a new one. Plastic high gloss. I have Brazil installed here, by the way, which is a rendering engine. Um, you get, if anybody who's done the download, uh, chances are will not have Brazil. So when you go to yours and look at it, you don't be like, why don't I have Brazil? All right. So now we're getting something that looks very render tastical. All right. The last thing that you can do is if you go to the display tab here, you'll notice that there's a bunch of different stuff you can do. Like, I don't know, shut off surface edges. So now it looks very much more rendery. Or maybe you like surface edges on so that you get a little bit more of a technical view there. So what I do when I build stuff for clients is, is I will typically only go about this far. And then I will come in here and do some screenshots, which you can do up here. Capture viewport to pile to file to pile. <laughs> capture viewport to file or capture viewport to clipboard. And so what I'll do is I'll capture the viewport typically to the clipboard. I'll then cut and paste those into Photoshop, make a little sheet out of how to do that, you know, of what it looks like, and then I'll send it to the client for comments. I'll take a couple, I'll take one from here, 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 let them see all that stuff, and then go from there. And that's about as far as I go for a concept model. That, that would then go to the client. The client would then make markups on it and send it back to me. And the cool thing about this, okay, watch this. Let's take a screenshot of this in the front perspective. And I'm going to just do this in wireframe. Now I'm going to do this in shaded. All right, so there's our shaded. I'm going to shut up ground plane for right now. And let's take a screenshot of this. So I'm going to capture the viewport to a file. Boop. And I'm going to save this to my desktop. And this is going to be screen cap. All right. So I can go into Photoshop or anything. In this case, I'm going to use Sketchbook Pro because it's super fast. Ah, nice. Crash. Way to go, Alias. All right. And I'm going to... Do, do, do. Edit. Yeah, let's open this file. Open screen cap. 
and I'm going to do a little markup on this. All right, so let's say I'm the client, and I got this thing, and I got this up here, and we're going to do it in red, and we're going to say, uh, I want this to be more like this, and I want this to be, because I'm a client, and I have terrible taste, so I'm going to move this over here, and then I want this to be like this, and I want this to have bunny ears, all right, and then I save this, and this is, this is my comments from my client, so I'm going to save this as desktop, JPEG, comments, okay, now, when I go back into Rhino, the client sent me these comments, how am I going to bring those comments in so I can work on them? Say it with me. Picture frame. I'm going to find my comments. I'm going to lay these down right in the window. I'm going to line them up exactly. Go to wireframe. I'm going to line these up exactly with my model. I'm going to scale these up a little bit. And I've got an exact representation of what my client wanted. And then I can use this as a modeling guide just like we did from the very beginning. So this is what I do every day. This is, this is literally my workflow. Um, I, I work with all of my clients like this. And most of them are super, super reasonable, even though I've had some fun at their expense with this webinar here and their comments. But the, the idea of starting with reference, sending it to the client, having them mark, that up, mark it up, bring it back in with picture frame, and then model right on top of this, you know, that's, that's the workflow. That's how you do this. And that's how you can kind of get over this clean sheet syndrome because, um, you know, once you have a guide in there and you know what you're aiming for, then that puts you in a position where you can start modeling confidently. So that's pretty much what I've got for you today. I don't want to get too crazy with this because it's a it's a you know it's a beginning webinar and I don't want to I don't want to overwhelm anybody. But we're ideally going to be doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, we're we're going to be doing um, more beginner type webinars. Um, we're going to start doing some Mac based webinars uh, for Rhino Mac. And, and things like this. So hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully this is something that you've learned something. Um, hopefully it's given you the confidence to lay down that first curve and start, and start modeling something. Um, hopefully I've given you a few little techniques in here that you can use to, uh, to take that first step and, uh, and get started with Rhino. So that's the end of what I have to show you. Um, I think I even did pretty good as far as keeping to my time. I'm 